James Annitz, 16, and Simon Amos, 17, from different parts of the country, separately answered ads in 1986 to work as cattle station hands, or jackaroos, at Flora Valley Station, located in the dry, arid, and inhospitable area known as the Kimberley in the state of West Australia. Six months later, the two teenage boys mysteriously vanished. After an extensive search, their bodies were found under strange circumstances. For over 30 years, no one truly knows what happened. This is the mystery of Flora Valley Station. Welcome back to another episode of Shadow Matter. Today's video is of the Flora Valley Station mystery. The story of two inexperienced teenage jackaroos who vanished in the remote Kimberley region of West Australia. We have briefly discussed this case in a previous episode containing other mysteries of the Australian outback. After a few requests, I've decided to make a full-length video on this subject. If you haven't seen the other video, a link will be provided in the description below. By 1986, the Australian cattle industry was in a state of depression, forcing many station owners to cut costs wherever they could in order to save money. One cattle industry company known as Australian Stations Proprietary Limited chose to cut costs by hiring inexperienced teenagers under the belief they were temporary and could cost less than wages compared to more experienced stockmen. James Annitz was only 16 at the time when his auntie mentioned a job ad in a newspaper seeking jackaroos, 16 to 18, no experience required in West Australia. James, who had been struggling at school and had difficulty spelling, had shown a keen work ethic and wanted nothing more than to become financially independent. So when the opportunity came for full-time work on a cattle station, he excitedly jumped at the chance. James lived with his family in Griffith, New South Wales, and the thought of moving over 4,000 kilometers away to a remote and harsh region of the country made his mother quite apprehensive. James's parents were concerned with his safety would he be constantly supervised? Would he be paid fairly? Would meals be supplied? Vicky Loder, the wife of Giles Loder, the manager of a number of stations, including Flora Valley, assured James's mother over a number of phone calls these would all be supplied and that neither experience nor a driver's license was necessary. After a heart-wrenching month, James's parents let their boy go. Simon Amos, 17, came from a divorced family in the suburb of Paradise in Adelaide, South Australia. Like James, Simon also struggled at school but showed a keen interest in agriculture. His teachers even stated when they found out that he had headed north to work on a cattle station, it did not surprise them. He was described as a bit of a lad, a rogue, and cheeky. Simon arrived at Flora Valley Station in July 1986, a month ahead of James and when they arrived, they found the conditions of their homesteads and cattle station in disrepair, and it was obvious management had been cutting costs. Twenty years earlier, the homestead that James Annett was based at had employed over 120 jackaroos, stockmen, and cooks. There were hundreds of horses and working dogs, electric streetlights, a cool room compressor, hot water, and dozens of accommodation rooms, offices, workshops, and kitchens. But by 1986, the profitability of the cattle industry had collapsed. The garden sprinklers were turned off, and the once bustling station was reduced to two streets of empty, decaying buildings. Giles Loder was the manager of several stations under ownership of Peter Sherwin, including Flora Valley Station. The regime of the Sherwin Loder management was described as fist and steel capped boots. It was rough, harsh, and Loder was expected to produce maximum cattle for minimum costs. Most of the inexperienced boys they hired never lasted longer than two months. James and Simon's jobs focused on the maintenance of the equipment on the station. They primed the windmills and fueled the diesel pumps that kept the troughs and tanks offering barely drinkable bore water. The conditions were tough and the 12 to 14 hour days in 40 degrees Celsius heat were often enough for any man to call it quits before a season ended, let alone 16 to 18 year old inexperienced city boys. The boys were also subjected to violence on many occasions. Two weeks before the boys went missing, Giles Loder, the station manager, had hit James around the head with a spanner after the two were trying to repair a truck that James was driving. 
Loda threatened to take the repair costs out of his wages. Aside from the harsh, arid conditions and violence, the boys were often isolated, left to fend for themselves in dilapidated and abandoned homesteads hundreds of kilometers away from the main homestead at Flora Valley. Their only interactions with the outside world were by radio contact with the manager. There was little outside support other than that. On Wednesdays, they would drive to Flora Valley and pick up their mail and supplies. It was only on these days they could briefly socialize with other staff on the main station. They had only been working for seven weeks as jackaroos before Giles Loder isolated them on separate homesteads 180 kilometers apart. James wasn't happy about the transfer. Despite the light work of bore running, he would drive over 250 kilometers a day over unformed tracks and refueled pump motors. The homestead the boys lived in offered little in the way of luxury. The power switches would send out electric shocks when touched. Raw sewage would pour up from the drains in the shower, and the boys were told to use the power generator sparingly. As a safety protocol, the boys had to radio Flora Valley and let Giles' wife Vicky Loder know that they were still breathing. But in November 1986, Vicky Loder traveled to New South Wales to have her second child. The radio calls were taken over by the 16-year-old governess Therese Stansfield Campbell. But one particular day in late November, Giles Loder told her to stay out of the radio room. Why he did this was never clear. Shane Kendall, 24, an inexperienced jackaroo who was promoted to head stockman, was left in charge of the radios, but had little clue on how to operate them correctly. On December the 1st, the two boys missed their twice daily radio calls for 48 hours from Monday to Wednesday evening. Shane Kendall did nothing. Giles Loder's first inkling of trouble upon returning to Flora Valley Wednesday the 3rd of December was seeing the cattle milling about dry troughs at the Nicholson homestead bore, the homestead that James was stationed at. Loder drove to Nicholson and worked on the bore motor well into the evening. He checked James's room. It appeared to be normal. His possessions were still there, but instinct told him that James had been absent for a day. Possibly his vehicle had broken down in the bush. When the bore motor wouldn't start, Loder traveled 180 kilometers to Sturt Creek, where Simon was posted. There was a spare battery there, and Loder was going to ask for Simon's help to replace it. However, when Loder arrived at Sturt Creek, he found Simon's bed cold and empty. The kitchen stank from putrid meat in the warm fridge. His cigarettes were left on the table, and his personal effects were still there. Loder believed Simon was on foot, and possibly suffered a mishap while out hunting. For some strange reason, Loder opened Simon's letters ready to be posted home. What can be noted as strange was how one of the unposted letters was mailed and postdated on Thursday the 4th of December, 72 hours after Simon's last radio contact. Loder drove back to Flora Valley, arriving at about 10 a.m. Thursday the 4th of December and called the Halls Creek Police via radio telephone. He asked them to look out for Simon but mentioned nothing about James. Loder called again at 12 noon and stated that he flew over a 5 km radius and had a ground party searching for Simon. Strangely, none of the workers can recall a search party at all. Again, there was no mention of James or his missing Datsun Ute. The police arrived at Sturt Creek Homestead at 6.10 p.m. and found the homestead in darkness. They searched the buildings, sheds, abandoned vehicles, tanks, water troughs, and through Simon's belongings. The police camped overnight, but Simon never returned. It wasn't until next morning that Loder reported to the police that a second person was missing also, James Annitz. It was now 96 hours since the boys were last seen or heard from. From what we can tell, James and Simon appeared to have joined up on the night of December the 1st and drove into the desert in the unroadworthy Datsun Ute. No one knows where they were headed or just what they were doing. A three-day aerial search of an area covering 100,000 square kilometers failed to find any trace of the boys who were presumed to have perished in the desert. The media at the time tried to get a hold of any information they could, Loder telling them that the boys had stolen his truck and most likely tried to return home. This was, however, far from the truth. The police believed Giles Loder when he told them that he believed the boys had abandoned their jobs and stolen his ute. He believed this was done in retribution for withholding their previous two months' wages. Both boys hadn't been paid for some time. James's parents were a little more skeptical and flew to the area to help with the search. 
It should be noted that police found them to be annoying and failed to head their requests for further extensive searches. Five months later, on Sunday the 26th of April, 1987, the missing Datsun Ute was found by two bulldozer drivers in sand dunes about 500 kilometers southeast of Halls Creek. The truck had become bogged down in the sand track, normally only used by seismic survey teams. For a normal car, driving these tracks would have felt like driving into water. A statement from one of the bulldozer driver reads, Halfway up a dune, facing north. Vehicle was bogged at rear wheels. Occupants had obviously tried to dig Ute out. He goes on to say, We lifted the bonnet. There was an alligator clip onto the positive pole. There was a battery at the front on the ground. It was obvious that the boys had tried to jump start the car after it failed to move any further in the unforgiving desert. Near the car, a star picket and a burned branch pointed north. On the roof of the ute, an SOS had been formed using spanners. The dozer drivers found a long-handled shovel 75 meters further along, and another four and a half kilometers, the remnants of a red checkered shirt. They raced off to alert police about what they had found. Police found Simon Amos's body 19 kilometers north of the vehicle. It had been apparent that the two boys had made a camp. The bones had been bleached by the sun of the desert, and had indications of wild dog teeth marks. There was also a bullet hole from a rifle in Simon's skull. A further kilometer away from the camp, they found the remains of James Annitz. He left behind a water bottle with a message scratched into the lid. It reads, James, my fault. I always love you, mum and dad, Jason, Michelle, Joanne. And on the handle was written, I found peace. What the police discovered has never fully explained the boy's fate, but a coroner later found James died of dehydration and Simon from a gunshot wound in his head. What exactly happened to James and Simon in the desert? James was a boy scout who knew how to survive if stranded. Why was there no evidence of a fire to signal for help? There were, after all, unused matches found in the cab of the truck. Another vital piece of evidence further mystified investigators. In addition to the marked difference in the decomposition of the boys' bodies, human blood was found on James's hat. Later blood tests revealed that the blood did not belong to James or Simon. The difference between the two boys' decomposition indicated that Simon had died much earlier than James, some suspected by at least a month or even more. A memorial was held for the two boys in Halls Creek on the 30th of May. Prominently absent from the ceremony, were the loaders, Giles and Vicky. They never even offered a phone call to the parents to offer their condolences. More than 30 years have passed and still it is unsure what truly happened to James Annitz and Simon Amos at Flora Valley. What do you think happened? Is this a cut and dry case of two teenage runaways who ran into trouble in the desert? Or did something more sinister take place? Let us know in the comments below. This has been an episode of Shadow Matter we hope you enjoy this episode, and if you'd like to see more content like this, then don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe, and also check that notifications bell to keep up to date with new videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter.